Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about student debt. Deanne Lunen is an attorney with the National Consumer Law Center and director of NCLC's Student Loan Borrower Assistance Project. Deanne assists attorneys representing low-income low income consumers and is a member of the U.S. Department of Education's Student Loan Negotiated Rulemaking Committee. Heather Jarvis is founder of AskHeatherJarvis.com, a website focused on student loan issues. Heather chairs the Government Relations and Student Financial Aid Committee for the Legal Section of Legal Education and Admissions to the Bar at the American Bar Association. Chris Latham is Director of College Counseling at Washington Latin Public Charter School. Chris is a graduate of Mount Holyoke College and is a recipient of the Colleges That Change Lives, Counselors That Change Lives Award. Welcome to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, thanks again for coming on. Uh, Chris, maybe if we could start with you. Could you uh, explain, how does someone apply for financial aid? Uh, a student comes into your office, maybe with a mom or a dad. How, how does that work? Uh, the process of applying for financial aid can be complicated, um, but the general premise is that if a student is interested in receiving um, financial aid outside of merit-based scholarships, um, the family should fill out the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid. Um, that form will determine what the family's expected family contribution is, what the family can afford or um, seems to be able to afford to pay for the child's education. Um, some colleges do require the college scholarship search um, profile, the CSS profile. Um, and that asks more specific questions than the FAFSA. Um, some colleges use it because it gives them a clearer picture of what the family's ability to pay is. Um, and then also there are opportunities for students to apply for outside scholarships from the community, the church, um, churches in their community, those sorts of things. So that's the general process of applying for financial aid. And if a student comes into your office, would you ever have a discussion with them about, well, this school is too expensive or this school, or you might be taking out too many loans if you went to this university? Um, when I meet with students and parents, what I typically talk to them about is the process of applying for financial aid. Um, I never tell a family that they shouldn't apply to a school because of the sticker price. Um, one of the things that I've learned in my experience, especially working in college admissions, is that just because a college is expensive doesn't mean that it's not affordable. So I do counsel them on things like student loans, um, for them to examine their personal finances and what they're comfortable taking out in loans, either for themselves or for their child. Um, but also really do encourage them to explore all options, to contact financial aid offices, um, to see if there's you know, any wiggle room at all in the financial aid package. Fair enough. And Dean, you get involved when students are having trouble paying their student loans, if I understand this correctly. Right. Almost everybody who we see directly, and then also we work with other attorneys and other advocates across the country who work with borrowers, are in some sort of trouble with their student loans. And are they in trouble because they took out too many loans? Are they in trouble because something happened that they didn't expect? It's a range, but generally it's not too many loans in sort of a traditional sense. I think there are outliers, people who have these very, very high amounts of debt, but the risk factors for default are a little bit different. Um, for example, uh, the vast majority of people who default did not complete their educations. So that's a huge risk factor. A lot of the people we work with, and this is really important, are what they call non-traditional students. It's sort of an interesting term because, in fact, there are more non-traditional students than there are traditional students. And that means you know, adults, generally over 25, independent, so they're not actually have parents necessarily working with them. So those are, those are actually other risk factors for default. So if, if I'm 25 years old and I'm thinking about going back to school, um, would you ever advise someone not to do that? Or I'm a little confused exactly what would happen in that discussion. Yeah, I mean, we, first of all, we never see people before they go to school. I mean, if people came to us before they go to school, that would be great, because I think we could do a lot of preventive counseling. But I would never tell somebody not to go to school. I mean, I'm, that's really not my area of expertise. I think somebody who understands more whether someone's going to benefit from education, someone with an education background or something, would be more appropriate with that. But if I did have that opportunity to speak with someone before they went, I would absolutely talk about the numbers of loans they're taking out, and even more important, the types of loans they're going to take out, and if it's possible to go to school without having to take out loans. Fair enough. And maybe, Heather, if you can speak to the issue of uh, Deanne's point about the types of loans. What types of loans are there? Well, there are two 
major categories of student loans. There are federal student loans and there are private student loans. And it is very important that people who are borrowing to pay for their educations always look to federal student loans first. Private student loans tend to be risky and expensive for student loan borrowers. They don't have the same borrower protections that the federal student loan programs have, and they don't have the same flexible repayment options. So I'm not a big fan of private student loans, and I tell all the young people I know to look to the federal loan programs first. But what if they can't get enough federal loans and they need to then need extra money and they have to go to the private loans? And that is sometimes the case. Um, I might, um, in those cases, really be interested in pointing out to the family or the student in that case that maybe there are other educational options that could be more affordable for that family. And in some cases, private student loans may be the answer. Um, but federal student loans have borrowing limits that, um, that will put you know, some sort of, of um, balance uh, in the debt load that students and graduates are looking at. Because student debt can be very hard to manage for many people. Well, can you work this, maybe if I can open this up to all of you, what would, can you walk us through how a family, an average family, I know there's no average, average family, but an example of someone who's struggling with student loans, how many loans do they have, what's the average, uh, what's the payback per month? Well, um, the, the actual average student loans is bur um, burden is somewhere around $25,000. So I know there's a lot of people who have much, much more than that. I think those stories tend to get a lot of attention. But that's the average. And if you have federal loans, as you know, Heather was talking about the distinction between federal and private, there are a lot of options available to you to actually have those payments on the loans be very affordable. There's income-based repayment plans. There are deferment options to postpone payments if you're in trouble for a short period of time. They're not always easy to get these options, but they're available. Um, on the private loan side, however, there aren't those same sort of range of options. So it's, it's not true for everybody, but most people who are able to sort of stay on top of their federal loans can usually figure out a way to keep the payments affordable. Either of you want to add to that? or? Well, I would say that um, you know, Deanne is absolutely right. There are much better options for working uh, with the federal student loan debt. And really, the best source of information for those options is Deanne's website, which is studentloanborrowerassistance.org. There's lots of great information there. And people have more um, ability to get affordable payments and relief when they're struggling financially if they do that before they're late on their payments or certainly before their, their loan enters default because then the, the options are more complicated and more difficult for borrowers to access. But let's say I just lost my job or, I, or something happened to my family. How do I communicate that to uh, the person who lent me the money? Well, it's important to stay in touch with your lender. It's important to know what kind of student loans you have. So I know the first thing that we tell borrowers is to determine exactly which loans they have, who their lender is, who their servicer is. And you can do that using the National Student Loan Data System. It's nslds.ed.gov. And that will give you access to a complete list of the federal student loans that you've borrowed. Private loans, there's no uh, such database that's comprehensive. I usually recommend that folks pull their credit report um, at annualcreditreport.com, and then they can get a list of what their private student loan debts are. Fair enough. And, and Chris, do you, how detailed do you get into discussions with, with some of your students' families about some of, these, the, some, of, some of this, some of what we're talking about today? I get as detailed with the families as they ask to be. Um, one of my main responsibilities to my families is to be able to provide information um, and guidance through the financial aid application process. Um, so I do a lot of things in terms of scheduling financial aid nights where I bring in um, financial aid officers from local mm -hmm. colleges and universities. Um, here in Washington, D.C., we have the D.C. College Access Program that makes available to students the D.C. Last Dollar Award, and students also have um, access to DC, um, the tuition assistance grant. So I do make sure that I also bring in outside resources for the students, um, but it's very important to me that the families understand student loan debt and what that means, not just for the student, but also for the parent and the importance of starting early in their search when it comes for financial aid. 
Fair enough. You mentioned the DC TAG program, and that was something I wanted to discuss a few segments ago uh, when we had a discussion, but we ran out of time. Would you mind saying a word or two about the DC TAG program? Sure. The DC TAG program is um, available through OSSI, which is the Office of the State Superintendent. Um, and basically, it's available to students who are DC um, high school graduates, whose parents are um, also residents of DC. Um, and if a student plans to enroll at a public university anywhere in the country, um, then they are afforded up to $10,000 to make up the difference between in-state and out-of-state tuition. If they choose to go to a historically black college or university, then they're able to receive $2,500. Um, and then the same thing with any colleges that are located in the District of Columbia, Maryland, or Virginia. Fair enough, that's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. We did want to discuss that a few <laughs> segments ago and we ran out of time, so thank you. Of course. Um, in terms of the, the public, I'm hearing a public policy uh, discussion here. Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of public policy, we want to encourage people to go to college and we want to encourage kids and adult learners to go to school. But on the other hand, we don't want to have people have so much debt that they can't pay it back and then they're uh, essentially crippled by the debt. How do we juggle that? Yeah, well, I mean, so a couple of things on that. I mean, the, the first point, and this is clearly the policy advocacy work we do, the goal is about more equal access to higher education. And I think it's important as a public policy matter that we all look back at how we've done in reaching that goal. We've poured a lot of money into the federal aid programs. They've switched more from grants to loans over time. And over these many years since the 60s, the gap between college completion among the higher income individuals in this country and the lower income, income individuals in this country has grown actually over time. So in that sense, with high equal education as a goal, we failed. So, so that's the first thing. Um, so one thing we have to do is rethink how we do it. Uh, the second point is that we've sort of done this kind of, I don't know, it, without much debate, but we have front end, what I would call front end, meaning the, how people get loans, how they're eligible. We're very liberal at the front end. There's no credit check, really, for most people. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it means that there, there's not that much standards, there's not much that out accountability for the schools, whether they actually are doing their job and leading people to the outcomes they're supposed to get from college. So we've had this very liberal front end, and what's happened at the same time, little by little, but very seriously, is we've created what I call draconian back end, meaning that we're giving all this money on the front end, we're giving people money to go to school. If they get into trouble, we go after them in ways that we don't go after anybody else. So in some ways, we're, we're paying for the front end with this extremely draconian back end, and my point as a public policy matter is it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, we can promote access and give people another chance if they get into trouble. Given the political environment in Washington, how could that happen? Well, the political environment in Washington is very difficult to get a lot of things to happen. I mean, that's, that's true. Um, but I think, and something we do on behalf of low-income borrowers, since we do all the time, and y you keep pushing. Um, and there's things like, um, you know, a lot of this is actually restoring bankruptcy relief, for example. Other things that have actually been done in times when the political climate was, was also difficult, so it's not impossible. Um, for example, it was only in 1996 that we started taking social security payments from people for student loan debt, which is really outrageous. It's, it's, it's unprecedented, it's extraordinary. Um, and so it's not like this has been around forever. Before 1996, there was a lot of difficult political environments and nobody ever thought of doing that. So I think that we have to, even in the difficult environment, think of creative ways to actually you know, sort of keep our eyes on the prize and figure out you know, what is the goal of all this. You know, it's, it's not for schools to make money, it's not for lenders to make money, it's to make sure that people who go to higher education actually achieve their outcomes and don't end up, end up stuck in debt. Fair enough. Well, in terms of one of those creative things, um, loan forgiveness programs, as you all know, are, are, you know, are the talk of the town. Uh, Heather, maybe if you could say a word or two. How does that work? How does a loan forgiveness program work? 
Well, Steve, there are a lot of different kinds, and everyone is designed differently and has different um, eligibility requirements. Some cover certain types of student debt and not other types of student debt. Many include some sort of service requirement. So a borrower would need to be employed, for example, in a, govern a government position or a nonprofit position. Um, but most of these programs uh, really help um, highly educated and high debt student loan borrowers more than they do those who have either not completed their degree or have other reasons for struggling with their student loan debt. So loan forgiveness programs are really only helpful for a very small segment of the student loan borrower population. And they don't, as a public policy matter, have the ability to really solve much of what are the most serious problems um, with access to education. Uh, so, as Deanne said, restoring bankruptcy rights, fair bankruptcy rights, it would be a wonderful step in the right direction. Uh, there's no reason uh, particularly that private student loan debt should be treated any differently in bankruptcy than other kinds of consumer debt. Um, that sort of special treatment doesn't make um, a lot of sense from a policy perspective. Um, but there are also some things that can help people right now, and we don't have to wait for Congress and Washington to sort of start moving. Um, there's an income-based repayment plan that can be very helpful for a lot of people who are struggling with student loan payments, um, both those who might have eligibility for loan forgiveness and also those who are, are just on hard times, whether it's because of unemployment or illness um, or um, having not completed their degree program. And that's income-based repayment. And I, for one, certainly wish that the, that the government would do more to promote the availability of that program. It's available now, um, and it's, it can be very helpful for a lot of people. Fair enough. Why couldn't we ask universities to chip in more? We can, and we should, uh, and I do. Um, I, I regularly travel to universities um, and ask that, that they um, contribute you know, to this discussion. I mean, both when it comes to controlling costs, but also when it comes to helping people understand what their options are. Uh, you know, I mean, for example, income-based repayment, very underused. Uh, and part of that is because it's difficult to understand, difficult to access. Um, and I'd like to see the schools contribute more to the, um, disseminating that information. Yeah, and the schools can also be held more accountable for their outcomes and potentially even tie their ability to get aid in the first place for their students mm -hmm. to the outcomes that their students get. Um, I think that that would certainly be an incentive. It's, it's, it's about financial mm -hmm. incentives, ultimately. And, the, and that's, I think, one thing about higher education is it's a, it's a business. I think mean, people don't always like to think of it that way mm -hmm. because it's so much more in some ways than a business. But ultimately, for the schools, and a lot of the schools anyway, it's a business, and so there are ways to make sure that if they're gonna participate in these aid programs, they have to do more upfront counseling and, and helping borrowers like Heather was talking about, but they also will be accountable for their outcomes in a way that might mean that the aid gets cut off for them if they don't perform. Fair enough, Chris, do, do, you, do you ever talk to students about, do students ever ask you about what the probability is that they would graduate within a certain amount of time if they were to go to university X or Y? Um, they do, and financial aid does factor into that question with some of my students. Um, I have students who have made very purposeful decisions about starting off at a community college because it would be much more affordable for them um, to get one or two years of general requirements mm -hmm. out of the way at a community college before then transferring to a four-year college. Um, so that is something that is a, a lot of concern to my students because I've also taken um, a lot of time to educate students about looking at graduation rates of the colleges where they're interested in applying and making sure that they understand that cost and student debt will factor into possibly how long it takes them to complete their four-year degree. Fair enough. And could all of you maybe comment about what is the, I didn't understand the president's initiative exactly. Where is the president's initiative that he announced at the end of last year? How far along is this initiative? So, so President Obama announced um, essentially sort of a, he called it a pay-as-you-earn plan. And Heather already mentioned the income-based repayment plan. So it's not a brand new plan. It's basically extending what was already available to more people under the income-based repayment plan. Part of it is in effect already, but it's a fairly small program. Uh, the rest of it actually doesn't have to go through Congress but it does have to go through what they call a rulemaking process, basically writing the regulations, which is one of the things that I'm involved in right now. 
And so the final details are actually not settled yet. But is that essentially asking the government to underwrite people who are having trouble paying back their loans? No, it's, it's different. Again, it's, it's not a new program. It's basically taking the income-based repayment plan that's already out there, which um, can lead to consequences for taxpayers, if, if that's what you're asking, because in the sense that um, it allows people to pay only what's affordable for them, and then ultimately, after a certain period of time, for some people it's going to be 20 years, for some people it's going to be 25 years, and that's part of the complicated details of all this, um, the rest of the debt level, if there's any left, will be written off. And so that does have consequences for taxpayers, but people going into default also has consequences for taxpayers. Um, so again, it's not a new plan, it's taking that already existing income-based repayment plan and extending some of the more favorable terms of it to more people. Um, but it's very confusing, I mean, people know, and, and it's the, the new plan that the president announced, I think he's doing what he could because Congress, frankly, isn't doing anything right now on this. But it affects. We are, we are broadcasting the show. That, that's fine. It's <laughs> if Congress get start working, you know, um, and and the president yeah. um, is, was doing what he could, I think, because Congress isn't acting. But I think it's also important for people to realize it affects a relatively small number of people. The new initiative that the president just announced. Fair enough. You know, this this does remind me of an interesting discussion about you know the old campus radio station, right? Let's say I don't like the songs that the campus radio station plays. Do I get uh, a discount on my student affairs fee because I didn't like the song? And it really it seems to me that this really gets to the issue of what responsibility do we have as citizens to make sure that other citizens have a better chance for higher education? And there's probably a balancing act somewhere between where we want more people to go to school, but other people say, well, why am I paying for you to go to school? I, I assume that's what you're struggling with on your uh, rulemaking committee. Right. I mean, I think um, one thing is people have to realize that there are a lot more benefits mm -hmm. to higher education than just the degree that the individual gets. There are societal benefits. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, some of this is unclear about why this happens, mm -hmm. but having people, people participate more in society, they tend to have lower crime rates. There's a lot of tangential benefits to higher education. So if I'm an individual taxpayer, that's something that I should be interested in just, just because it's better for society. But I also think as a taxpayer, it's important for people to say, but I want to make sure that my investment through federal aid is working. And that's legitimate. And that's, that's the schools and, and students mm -hmm. themselves taking some responsibility too. I mean, I think those are all legitimate questions to, to ask and be concerned about. But I hope that people realize that, that it's not just for themselves. If they've already gone to college, all this doesn't matter for me anymore. I mean, it matters for everybody in society. You guys want to add to that? I agree completely. We, we need a world in which people are educated. Our country cannot continue to compete in the global marketplace without an educated um, populace. And so it's very important that we figure out how we can um, improve access to education. Um, and as we discussed early on, you know, a large part of the way we f make that happen now is a debt-based access to education system where uh, individuals borrow a lot of money in order to be able to go to school. And it, that's not necessarily all bad because it does enable people who don't already have money to go to school, which is great. It certainly worked for me. Uh, you know, my sister and I are both first generation college educated. I would not have the degrees I do if not for student loan debt. Um, but I certainly, you know, I, I've been paying $1,200 a month on my student loans for 14 years, Steve, and I'm going to be doing that, you know, until I'm 60. So um, it's important to, to think about and be deliberate with our decisions. Um, and as Deanne mentioned, we don't want our tax dollars necessarily going to just any school that can open its mm -hmm. doors and call itself um, an educational institution. You know, so they are not all created equal. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some schools that have had the ability to really benefit financially and profit from um, taxpayer dollars and federal aid programs in a way that is not always appropriate. And Chris, maybe if you could say a word or two about uh, for-profit schools and non-profit schools. Um, For-profit schools um, tend to have programs where students are able to earn some sort of degree or certification in a very, very short amount of time. Um, and I've actually had the opportunity um, to work at one. I took an opportunity to do that just so I had a sense of 
what they were offering and how the process worked. Um, and what I've learned is that um, the students who tend to go to these for-profit schools end up in a deeper hole more often than not in terms of their student loan debt um, because they're not very clear on the terms of what they're actually signing up to do in terms of student loans and how that repayment process is going to happen for them um, after they've earned their certification um, as opposed to nonprofit schools where it is a little bit more spelled out for students. Um, there's usually some sort of entrance or exit counseling for those students so they have an understanding of what types of loans they have, um, when the repayment begins, how repayment begins for them. Um, so there's definitely a difference between um, those two types of schools and the type of aid that is offered. Um, but again, I think with the for-profit schools, um, the process gets to be a little bit trickier for the students who choose those. Fair enough. Yeah. Only if a, um, I'm sorry. Please. I was going to say the, the outcomes in general are much worse at the for-profit schools, yes. and about two-thirds to 70 percent of the clients I see have attended for-profit schools. Two-thirds? Yes. Mm -hmm. And do, they, do, you, do those two-thirds uh, have debt more than the $1,200 that we just heard about per month that we just heard a second ago? Well, that would be their monthly payments, I think Heather was referring right. to, but yes. yeah, I mean their, their average uh, loan balance is generally high, but that can be true in other mm -hmm. sectors as well. Um, but, but again, the main problem is that they, um, they mostly didn't complete and they're in default in almost all cases. And I've never had a client from a for-profit school that actually got a job in the field they were supposedly trained for. Well, well, that's a discussion for another day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're gonna have to leave it at that. So I'd like to thank you all uh, for coming today. Thank, thank, you. thank you. If you would like additional information about the National Consumer Law Center, Heather Jarvis, or Washington Latin Public Charter School, please visit nclc.org, askheatherjarvis.com, or latinpcs.org. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.